How many of you enjoy a good mystery? You enjoy reading a, a mystery novel, or how about watching a, a movie that was a, a mystery or a TV show that's a, a mystery? One of the shows I really enjoyed was uh, the BBC production of Sherlock, you know, Sherlock Holmes. It was a great show, and Sherlock Holmes, along with his sidekick Watson, they would, there would always be a mystery. They'd have to solve some crime, some crime was committed, some murder was committed, and they would try to solve who did it. And so throughout the show, there were all these clues that were revealed. Now, you didn't always realize they were clues at the time. You would realize if you went back and watched it again. And then at the end of the show, almost at the end of the show, Sherlock would gather the people around and he would tell you about all these clues and he would reveal to you who committed the crime or who committed the murder. And as he kind of brought all the clues together and he, he solved this mystery, you're like, aha, now I get it. The mystery has been solved. I like mysteries. I'm sure a lot of people do as well. Well, today we're going to talk about one of the, the great mysteries ever. One of the great mysteries ever. Um, and ha this mystery is so important because it affects the way you and I live our lives and the way we are designed to live our lives. The mystery that we're going to look at today is found in the book of Colossians. So if you could open up your Bibles or turn them on to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading from verses 24 to 27, just, uh, just a second. Colossians 1, verses 24 to 27. Where we began a series last week, and the series is called, guess what? Hope rises. And we're talking about this great word of hope. We did an intro last week. You can go back, go on YouTube to watch it if you missed it. But today we're talking about the mystery of hope. So Colossians chapter 1, Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, one of his prison letters. He's writing it while he's in prison to the church in Colossae. And it says these words, Colossians 1 verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The, here we go, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Verse 27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this, again, mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul's talking here about this as a the fullness of the gospel. And he says it's a mystery that's been kept hidden from, uh, hidden for ages and gen generations in verse 26. So before this time, there was a mystery. And there was sort of like a missing piece, the key missing piece. So you know, the people before Paul in the Old Testament time, these, uh, the great saints, the people who wrote down the scriptures, people like, say, Abraham or Moses or the prophets, when they wrote things, at the end of the day, they'd be like, hmm, something's missing. There's a, a missing piece here. There's a mystery. <clears throat> and now Paul said, it was kept hidden for ages past and generations, but now it has been revealed to you, this mystery. And in verse 27, it says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. One of our young people, uh, Aaliyah, uh, did this drawing for the children. I don't know if you can see it, but it is Colossians 1, 27. And the kids today, as you're watching, can color this in. A lot of good things for the kids today. But this verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there's something in here which is, I would say, this mystery is the key to understanding what our true hope really is. So Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, let's talk about this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And let me just say that uh, this message, this passage has, 
has so impacted my life. I heard it uh, many years ago, 1987, from a fellow by the name of Charles Price. And I thank him for many of the concepts, uh, really from Charles, that I'll be sharing today. But it really revolutionized and changed Carol and my life way back in 1987. Christ in you, this mystery, the hope of glory. Let's talk about this word, hope. Well, the hope which we talked about last week, the hope of glory. So let's talk about glory. What is glory? I mean, glory is a great word, isn't it? It's a great biblical word, but let's be honest. It's one of these words sort of like blessed, which sounds great, great, and we kind of put it in different sentences, but we're not really sure what this word glory means. So I don't mean to offend anyone, but in this context, glory is not referring to heaven. So it's not saying here, Christ in you, the hope of heaven. Sometimes we've used this phrase, glory, as a substitute for heaven. But in this context, it's not referring to heaven. It's not. I mean, sometimes we hear people say, so-and-so died and they've gone on to what? To glory, to heaven. But here, this word glory is not referring to heaven. Heaven would be glorious, but it's not this, what this word means in this context. The word glory, the Greek word glory, doxa, essentially it means this, according to W.E. Vine in his uh, expository dictionary. He says, it essentially speaks of the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. What he essentially is and does. So the glory of God, very simply put, is the character of God. Does that make sense? The glory of God is the manifestation of God's character. The glory of God is the character of God. The glory of God is the character of God. And so as when, when, when Jesus came to this earth, we are told that he revealed God's glory. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 14, John 1, verse 14, it says this, The word, that is Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his, what? Glory. Not heaven. We've seen his glory, the character of God, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So it says there that when Jesus came to earth, fully man, fully God, we have seen God's glory. So that word glory there does not mean that, what, is, what does it mean when John says we have seen gl God's glory in Jesus? What did he actually see? Did he see kind of a bright light over Jesus' head in the, you know, sort of a shape of a, a lifesaver like some artists depict it? No. It says that when we saw when we saw when Jesus revealed God's glory, it means that he was revealing the very essence, the very character of God. And so the way Jesus lived his life, we saw what God was like. Does that make sense? So when Jesus was a boy and when he was out in the field and kicking the football or the soccer ball around, the way he interacted with his friends, we saw the glory of God. We saw what God was like. The way he would treat his friends, the way he would treat people that were kind of on the fringe. We saw what God was like in Jesus. The way he listened to his mom, the way he obeyed his mom. We saw what God was like. And when Jesus got older and worked in his father's carpentry, sh carpentry shop, we saw the glory of God in Jesus. What was that? We saw the character of God. So the way he did his work in the carpentry shop, we saw what God was like. The way he invoice people accurately. We saw what God was like. The way when he missed the word and hit his thumb with the hammer, ah! We saw in his reactions what God was like because the glory of God is the character of God. When it says we saw in Jesus the glory of God, we saw the character of God being manifested. It's incredible. And when Jesus began his public ministry, we saw the glory of God. We saw in Jesus what God was like. So when Jesus would go and sit by a, with a woman at a well, when no one, no one else from that town would dare go near that woman because of the things she did, we saw in Jesus the character of God. We saw what God was like. When a leopard came down the street, and lepers in those days, they had to have a bell, and they would have to ring and say, unclean, unclean, don't come near me. 
but Jesus. No one would go near and touch these lepers. But do you know something that's interesting? Jesus often went and touched the leper. Isn't that interesting? Every time Jesus encountered a leper, he would touch him. He would hold him because he had compassion and care. And so we saw in Jesus what God was like. See, the glory of God is the, uh, is the character of God. And I have some incredible news for you. Not only was that true of Jesus, he displayed the glory of God, the character of God. But guess what? It's also to be true of who? You and me. We were to display the glory of God. We were to display, we were to reflect the character of God. Because you go back right to the first book, the first chapter in the Bible, in Genesis 1, 26, 27, and it says what? That God created men and women in the, what? In the image of God, the character of God, the likeness of God. Now, we know the image, the character, the, ref, the image of God is not a physical image so much because God is spirit, but it's his moral likeness. It's what God is like. So in the very first human beings, they were created in the image of God. They were to reflect the glory of God the character of God, in those human beings, they reflect God's glory, God's character. So if we were in the Garden of Eden, say if we were a fly in the Garden of Eden, I don't know if they had flies before the fall, but say they did, and we were there and we observed the first human beings, if we watched them, guess what? We would have seen what God was like, the way they were talk to each other we saw we would see what god was like the way they would listen to each other the way they would care for each other the way they would love one another we would see what god was like because the glory of god is what is the character of god the way they would treat the creation and the animals and the plants and all of creation the way they would care for and treat for it, we would have saw what god was like and that was to be true of every human being. We were to reflect God's glory, the image of God, the character of God to other people. That's why we were made. But as you know, something horribly went wrong because that's not true, really, is it today? Yes, there is the God's image still in people, but as we watch the news, as we hear things, we see that people have fallen very short of that. We hear stories about racism. And something has gone horribly wrong. We see all these things taking place. We see in ourselves greed and selfishness and all those things. And something has happened. And what has happened is we have sinned. We have all sinned. And the word sin, actually at one point, one of the meanings is to missed the mark. It was used in archery at one time. And so when the person pulled back the bow and arrow and they were to shoot it, actually Joe has a good little picture here somewhere in one of the kids, yes, there's a, a little bullseye there, one of the kids' picture. So if it, if, it, if it missed, if the bow missed the bullseye, you know what it was called? It was called sin because the si sin was to miss the mark. And so if you missed the bullseye by a millimeter, it was sin. If you missed it by a centimeter, it was sin. If you missed it by a meter, it was sin. If you missed the bullseye by 60 meters, it was sin. If you shot the bow in the opposite direction, it was sin. Because sin is not so much a measurement of how bad you are, but it's a measurement of how good you're not. Does that make sense? Sin is not a measurement of just how bad you are, but it's a measurement of how good you're not. We've all missed the target. See, you don't congratulate yourself if you missed the bus by uh, if you missed the bus by a minute. I mean, if you missed your bus by a minute, or you missed your bus by thirty minutes, <laughs> or you missed your bus by an hour, you still missed your bus, right? You don't congratulate yourself. Wow, I did really good today. I only missed the bus by 30 seconds. 
Wow! No, no, no. Because to, to miss the bus is to miss the bus. Sin is to miss the mark. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the mark that we were, to, we were intended to hit? Well, there's a verse in Romans 3, 23, a verse I'm sure uh, many of you know. And the verse says, for all have sinned and come short of the, of the what? The glory of God. Every single person has missed the target, the bullseye. And what is the target? The glory of God. And what is the glory of God? It's the character of God. It's what Jesus Christ displayed, the image, the character of God. It's what human beings were meant to display. But we have sinned and come short of the target, of the bullseye, the glory of God. And so what is our hope? What is our hope? If this is the great hope, the great mystery to be solved, how can you and I live the lives we were meant to live? How, what is the hope for you and I to be the people God created? What is the hope for you and I, for this world, for this community, to once again reflect the image and the character and the likeness of God? What is our hope for the world? Well, we go back to those seven words. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, your hope and my hope of being the people God created us to be is Christ in you. Your hope of glory. Christ living his life in you and through you. Your hope of hitting the target. Christ in you is your only hope of glory, of being the person God created you to be. Christ living in you, his resurrected life, is the only hope for the people of this church to be the people God created us to be, to go out in this world and to do, make a life transformation in the calling Jesus has given us. Christ in you, your hope of glory. Not Christ alongside you. Did you hear that? No. Not Jesus Christ saying in heaven, saying, come on, you can do it. Come on, Samuel. Come on, I'm cheering for you. Come on, come on, come on. No. But Jesus Christ actually living his resurrected life in you and through you is your hope, your only hope of being the people God created us to be. And it's a, it's a simple message, but it's an incredibly profound and liberating message. I, I have to say, I've mentioned this to a few people. I told Samo before recording today, and I told Joe, a few other people this week. This message that we heard in 1987 truly transformed our lives. And I still struggle with it, <laughs> But this message that Jesus Christ lives in me is my hope of being the person God created us to be. It's wonderful, incredible, incredible message. And I would say one of the great dangers of Christian living today, at least in Canada and the West, and even the church, is that we have reduced the Christian life to a list of things we do. To a list of things that we do. We do this and we do that. Or sort of the moral teachings. And it, it, that has taken away the power of what the Christian life is. And that is the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. Living his life in you and through you. See it's not so much. It's not about what you do for Jesus. It's about what Jesus Christ is doing in you and through through you, if that makes sense. I heard uh, there was a fellow about not a long time ago named uh, D.L. Moody and a famous uh, preacher, and he used the uh, illustration that uh, I, I'm going to use right now. It's very helpful, and it really, dis it really demonstrates what, uh, what uh, we've been talking about. So 
he decided this. He would, uh, when he was speaking in front of his congregation or to his group of people, he would uh, have a glove. He'd bring a glove up, and he said this uh, glove had the form and the image of a, of a hand. And so you put the glove on, and what? You have four fingers, you have a, a thumb, you have a palm, you have a wrist. It was created, it was made in the image and the shape of a hand. That's what the glove was for, right? And it was, you can use it for different things to pick it up. And then he would uh, he'd just put the glove down here, and then he would have an object over here, um, you know, a book or something. I have a, a water bottle here. And he would talk to the glove, <laughs> and he would say, a glove, you were, you're the form, the image of the hand. You were created to pick up things. So why don't you do your job and go and uh, pick up the, the water bottle? Uh, excuse me, glove. I'm talking to you. Can you go and pick up the water bottle? And nothing happened. And he would raise his voice a little bit louder. Glove, I'm talking to you. You were created, you were made. This is your job. Go and pick up the water bottle. Nothing would happen. So he'd stomp around and he would yell at the glove, glove, pick up the water bottle. Hmm. And nothing happened. And someone <coughs> from the audience said, <laughs> D.L. Moody would say, this glove is a dud. This glove doesn't work. What's wrong with it? And someone would say, well, you got to put your hand in the glove. And he said, oh, okay. So he would put his hand in the glove and he would reach over and he would uh, pick up the water bottle. You see, this hand, what happened? Did the glove just learn a new trick? Did the glove just become really obedient and said, now I'm going to do what I was supposed to do? No. He said, the glove has become inhabited by the hand. The glove has become inhabited by the hand. And the power of the hand has become the power of the glove. The power of the hand has become the power of the glove. You know, you and I were made, created in such a way, but it's Christ living in us, living his life in us, that enables you and I to be the people that we were created to be. Now, every illustration has its shortcoming. This is not like we're a passive thing, a piece of material. I mean, no, we are called to do certain things, but the essence of the Christian life, the mystery, the hope that you and I, I have is that Jesus Christ is living his life in us and through us. If we know Jesus Christ, he is living his life in us and through us. And so it is Christ in us that expresses his character through us. It is Christ in us that expresses his character in us. And that is the great mystery that people didn't know in the Old Testament, in generations and ages past. But now this mystery has been revealed. It's the hope, our only hope, is Jesus Christ living his life in us and and through us. And so what's the what's the lesson? What's the challenge? You know, you've been watching my messages, you know, I like had to have application throughout, but I like to bring it to a challenge, right? So what's the challenge here? What what are you to do? Can I say nothing? Nothing. So much of our Christian life and Christianity has been reduced to just doing, doing, doing. And we have forgotten, and we keep forgetting, and I keep forgetting, that the mystery is that Jesus Christ lives in us by his Holy Spirit. And so this week, I'd like you to ponder that. I'd like you to ponder the reality, if you know Jesus Christ, that he actually is living in you. 
I think so often we have reduced Christianity to, you know, Jesus walking alongside us or Jesus cheering us on and all these things. Or just emulate Jesus, just copy Jesus. But I could never copy Jesus. You know, I don't, you know, those bracelets out, you know, a number of years ago, that saying, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, I know they were popular, but um, the truth is I often knew what Jesus would do. I knew I should forgive that person. I knew I should love that person. I knew I should share that, share the love of Jesus with that person. But it wasn't, I, I, I knew what I was supposed to, but I lacked it, the power to do it. Jesus says, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. So think about this great truth that Christ actually lives in you. Ponder that as you, th- as you face difficulties this week. What difference does it make that Jesus Christ, the living Jesus Christ, is living in you? What difference does it make in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that Jesus Christ is actually, his resurrected power is living in us? And my prayer my prayer that I've been praying for this message is that we would, there'd be people out there as you want, and you get it. You may have been a Christian for many years, but you, your Christian life has been trying to do your best for Jesus. And it's like pushing a bus uphill, and it's no fun. And my prayer is that <laughs> it would become real, this reality. Christ in you. Your hope of hitting the target. Your hope of being the person God created you to be. Ponder that truth this week and ask God to make it real for you. God bless you. Thank you.